we have uh, a lot of evening lectures on exotic subjects, exotic places. I think last time was Mars. Uh, so, so actually, it's nice and refreshing uh, to have a presentation this evening that, that brings us back to our own doorstep. Uh, seeing as we are the Geological Society of Glasgow. Uh, and uh, so I'm, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Murray Reed uh, for our presentation this evening. Um, so Murray uh, is, uh, is a retired engineering geologist. Um, he was brought up in uh, Gifnook, uh, not very far from where I live actually, um, and then went to St Andrews University in 1972 and graduated with a degree in geology. Um, and then uh, moved on to Aberdeen and did a PhD on, um, on uh, weathering of soils, um, and then and graduated in 79. Uh, and then uh, in, um, in January 1980, started working as an engineering geologist uh, with a small site investigation company in, in Cumbernauld. Um, and then after a few years, he moved on to Fabti Geotechnical in Glasgow. Um, on a number of really big infrastructure projects and some really international projects, yes, I think, ultimately, yes. yeah. Um, and then moved uh, down south to Reading to the Transport Research Laboratory back in the mid-90s, um, working on, uh, actually, the recycling and sustainability sectors. And retired from there in 2017 and moved back up here to Kirk and Tiller. Um, and then uh, became... Uh, active in the um, Kirk and Tilliken District Society of Antiquaries, which I think it says on the screen up there. Um, I think amidst all of this, you've also held office in the Geological Society of London Regional Groups as yes, well. So yes, uh, so, yes, that's quite a CV. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, you're a very keen uh, hill walker. I like this thing, uh, Hughes, Hills Shows. Under Graham Height. Shows, yes. Yeah. Yeah, uh, new, new category. You could have uh, hills under Graham elevation, which would be huge, which would make it sound much more impressive. Um, and so uh, this evening we're going to hear um, about what lies beneath. That's, that, that's an echo of the Geological Society of London's motto. Is it quid quid sub terra est? Your classical education. Um, so the floor is yours. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Colin. Uh, good evening, everybody. And uh, can I echo uh, the President's... Uh, Thanks to everyone for coming out on what's an absolutely foul night. Uh, it, uh, I'm very delighted to see so many of you here and I hope that uh, this, this will not disappoint because uh, this is a very local presentation uh, and it's not from an academic standpoint, it's from the standpoint of uh, a, a working geologist uh, now retired um, back in Kirkintillich where I, I uh, started out really. and. Uh, looking to see well what geology is available in the local area. This was very much a, a lockdown project in those first four months or so of lockdown where we weren't supposed to get out more than an hour a day and all this sort of thing. And uh, I started looking to see what's available that you can actually go and see and uh, finding that, well, there's not very much. Uh, and this picture here uh, really says it all. Uh, I'm standing on top of a colliery spoil tip uh, the Waterside Bing, it's uh, known as, and we'll come back to it uh, during the presentation, looking north across these rolling fields, uh, and you can see the uh, Kirkintillic itself, uh, at the eastern edge of it anyhow, uh, round there. Beyond that, there's the Kelvin Valley uh, down there, and up here we've got the, the, the uh, Lennox Forest, slightly higher ground. All these segments are all quite important, and we'll visit them a bit in there, but dominating everything to the north is the campses, and uh, we're going to sort of uh, look at, at what you can actually see. Well, you can see rock up there, uh, but beyond that, there's very little. This is all boulder clay, the, the, this rolling agricultural land, which covers vast areas of uh, west central Scotland. And uh, the Kelvin Valley is a very deep sequence of uh, fluvial glacial and other deposits in there, so there's no rock there. There's little uh, exposures around some of the streams around Lennox Forest, and then when you get up uh, into the camps, so there you can see uh, things. So this is a fairly good uh, expression of why, why I call the thing what lies beneath. Uh, I'm afraid it had nothing to do with the uh, motto of the Geological <laughs> Society. It's more related to the, the film, and it just was irresistible, uh, because we can't see very much, but there is geology in there. And there's a lot we can tell about the geology just from the remains and the human developments that have uh, gone on round about, because the geology influences 
the, the human activities, human settlements, transport routes and so forth, and, and vice versa. So we can infer quite a lot about what's below the, uh, the, the, the surface. I, I live in Kirkintilich. I, I lived there from 1981 to 95 when I moved down south and then from 2017 to present. Uh, and, and it's very much home uh, and, uh, and a fine place. So I'll take you on a kind of cook's tour of what we can see in the local area in terms of the types of rocks. And re I relate that to the human activity that, that's going on. That's hence bringing the local history and the geology together. Uh, and the first question that has to be answered, of course, is uh, for many people, I'm sure, where is Strathkelvin anyway? What is Strathkelvin? Well, it more or less coincides with what is now Eastern Bartonshire Council area. So here's Kirkintilla here, uh, right there, and we go up round the edge of the campsites through Milton and Campsie in Lennoxton, go down to Bishop Briggs to the Glasgow city boundary, and we come across to Mulgay and Bears Den <coughs> on the uh, western edge of, of Glasgow. It's basically the suburbs on the, the north side of Glasgow, and it kind of mirrors East Renfrewshire on the south side, which is, you know, gifted where I, I came from and, and so forth. But uh, to get Strathkelvin, which is the, the area on either side of the, the river Ke uh, Kelvin, the main Kelvin Valley, anything that drains into it and feeds it, we've got to add in a little bit here. We've got to go from Earl's Seat uh, up in the Capsies, cut across to about here, so we're including Strathblane, uh, Mugduck Country Park, which we'll certainly feature uh, all round here. And we've got to carry on along the watershed here eastwards, uh, past Kilside, and right up the Kelvin Valley, almost to Bank Knock, again to Kelvin Head, uh, which uh, you can just imagine is a little bit off uh, there and back round uh, down here to give us that, that Strath Kelvin in my definition. Uh, when I first moved to Kirkintilloch, it, it was in Strath Kelvin District Council, which was the local authority set up at that time. Uh, the, the, the name never seemed to be terribly popular, but I actually thought it actually described uh, the area fairly well because it was uh, settlements that uh, arose around the, the Kelvin Valley, the Glazert Water, which is a tributary, and the Allender Water, which comes down from uh, Mulgay and Bear's Den, and it all feeds into the <coughs> Kelvin, which goes away down uh, into the Clyde round here. So there is an actual logic in calling it Strathkelvin, and uh, that, that's my excuse at any So that, that's where Strathkelvin is. And uh, then, well, what can we actually see? That's uh, the first slide that indicates you, you, what we could actually see when you look in the ground. This is the geological map, the 1 to 50,000 uh, sheet, uh, 31 west. Uh, and you can see here, there's all these lovely bright colors that we have in geological maps. There's the lavas up here, all different types of lavas. Uh, and all these different colors are, of course, the different subdivisions of the Carboniferous sedimentary rocks above the, uh, uh, the lavas. Uh, note the deep blue, which is over, covers most of it. That, that's the upper limestone group, which is probably the predominant one in there. But we've got the limestone coal group. And uh, we, we've got the strata, strathclyde group, as it's nowadays called, lower limestone group, uh, and all that in there. Really, I'm covering the strata from the, the Clyde Plateau volcanic formation up to the upper limestone group. And we'll have a bit of a look at the uh, superficial deposits above it. Um, and on this, you can see there's limestones and coals marked with great confidence on the map uh, that you won't see any sign of on the surface. <coughs> These are all known, of course, from underground workings, from mines and uh, from there. And in some cases, things like the limestones from shallow quarries at surface, because all these, anything that has uh, been worthwhile for humanity, either as fuel, as construction material, uh, as fertilizer, like limestone for, uh, for fields, uh, or for chemical uh, uh, works has been found and extracted and that's all left traces it's dominated where people have settled the kinds of structures they've built the kind of landscapes and things that they've left behind so although this uh, you wonder well how do they know all this if there's nothing to actually see it all comes from the uh, activities of man over the centuries but, uh, so what we can, can we see what does it tell us do come in Thank you. about, what, uh, what, about what, uh, what lies beneath. In recent years, uh, there's also construction activities, which tell us a lot. And I, of course, have been in involved in that side of it. So I'll start a bit with that. But I'm basically going to do, as I say, a quick uh, tour around uh, some of the major rock types that you can see in, in the area, starting with the ones that are more immediately obvious, the camps is, say, uh, the lavas. Then we're going to look at the volcanoes. I can't really see any of them there, but they're at the west end. 
they were looking at the igneous intrusions because such rock as you can see in the lowland areas tends to be the hard things like the dolerite dikes and sills that stick up a bit. Uh, then we'll look at the main uh, sedimentary rock types, sandstone and conglomerate, limestone, and uh, anything connected with coal and the mudstone around it. So colliery spoil tips and old mine workings and the effects that has on the landscape and on the environment. Then I'm going to finish with looking at the superficial deposits because, as I say, that's dominantly what you see is the old boulder clay. And particularly, I want to finish on the Kelvin Valley itself, this great sword cut of a valley that runs right across the neck of central Scotland and historically and uh, geologically is very, very important. So just with, to start with that, I say I my initial, initially worked in site investigation in Cumbernauld and then uh, carrying that on on the consultancy side in Bantes thereafter. And we learn a lot about what's beneath the surface from the site investigations. And I've got here a rotary rig. This is well, how we get into bedrock. We core the bedrock and you get actual solid core that uh, I spent a lot of time in my uh, initial job logging. And we actually then, because uh, we were largely looking for old coal workings or things like that, or evidence of old coal workings and knowing what was underneath uh, there. Uh, we had the BGS uh, staff would come out from Edinburgh and log the, 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 the boreholes geologically. I'd done all the engineering measurements, so strength and joints and so forth. And they looked at the fossils and see what they could tell where we were in the sequence uh, in, in there. So that fed into the national database and these maps that we've got there. Uh, this is the type of rig that we use to get down through the soils to get to the rock. Uh, this is boring, it's called. This is drilling and this is boring on there. And uh, this tells us about the superficial deposits. It's not as a pretty unsubtle purpose uh, method, but it does enable you to get through the soil, find out what it is. And uh, we also did lots of trial pits, which tells you a lot more about the superficial deposits. But uh, 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 if it's below about three meters, you need to, to, to go through the boreholes. So that's the site investigation. Then there's actual construction itself. And I've just got one example in here, uh, actually from a project I was involved in for years uh, in my Baptist days down in England, uh, Carsington Dam, which is just off the edge of the Peak District on the south side. And uh, it's uh, uh, now Carsington Reservoir, Carsington Water. And uh, it's kind of a pump storage scheme with water from the River Derwent pumped up to it. And uh, it's very much important recreationally for the East Midlands area as well. Um, but in, the in order to build this big embankment dam, we had to get lots of fill out the ground. And this is the borrow pit. And we've, what we've got here is lower carboniferous mudstones with bands of limestone in there, uh, rather similar to a lot of lower carboniferous shales and mudstones and things in, in Scotland. Uh, and uh, a bit of, you can see it to get up to the surface, it's more weathered and uh, iron staining and things come, coming in there. That, of course, was all sealed over before the, uh, the, the reservoir was impounded. So the, the exposures like that and exposures along roads and, and so forth and done a lot of those, you get a brief window when you can actually see what the strata look like in, in total, as opposed to just the odd borehole here and there. It can be quite um, illuminating when you see what it really looks like rather than just drawing, trying to draw uh, lines between boreholes. Uh, so that's just a, an indication of how we can tell from construction, which uh, importantly nowadays uh, all construction projects tend to get captured by the, 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 the geological survey, the reports go there. Now, when I've done this talk before, it's, it's been to audiences in uh, Strathkelvin or Eastern Bartonshire who would know where all the places and locations I was referring to were, but I appreciate that might not be the case on this uh, audience tonight. So I've put in a few uh, diagrams to just sort of, you can, we can all locate ourselves in here. Uh, and these are just taken from the me memoirs, the British Geological Survey sheet memoirs. This is from the Airdrie District, sheet uh, 31 West. And basically, we've got the Campsies up here, the Campsie Fault, helpfully highlighted down there. All the, and the, the strata there, you can see, we're going, I'm not really going down into the Inverclyde group and things there, that's a, another, it's a camp covered everything, so we're, but we're going from here right up to the upper limestone group in there and just looking at everything there. And this is all the upper limestone group here. And again, you can see the black lines for the igneous uh, intrusions uh, in there as well. Probably down to about this sort of level of 70 uh, line there. Kirk and Tillich in the middle. And uh, if we go to the Glasgow sheet to, to get the west end of the campsies, unfortunately all the colours in here are totally different from where they are on the previous one. Um, 
good. But uh, it's the same sort of thing. You've got the Campsie Fells, you've got Patrick Hills coming across here, the Strathclyde group and the Limestone group and so forth. On top of that, into Milgai and Bear's Den, right, right around there. So I'll use these maps just to help people locate themselves. You know, here's Strathblane at the foot of the Campsies. Uh, here's Mulgai and there's a road links with two of these which I'll refer to quite a bit. Uh, Mugduck Country Park is sort of in here and uh, Bears Den, you know, you're into the outer suburbs of Glasgow here. So again, we're getting down to about, coming down around about this sort of level and then going off up the Kelvin Valley, around, around about, oh, probably around about here actually, towards Bishop Briggs uh, in, in, in there. That, so that's where we are and I'll, I'll flash these up every now and again to illustrate where we're going to. But we've got to start with the campses. Uh, as I say, if you live anywhere in Kirk and Tillich, and they, they dominate the view. You look to the north, there's this great rampart of hills. Um, the, the first shot uh, showed them under snow on a lovely January day uh, a few years ago before COVID. Uh, this is in, in the full spring, in May 2020. And so we've come up here now, we're in Peel Park in Kirk and Tillich. Uh, we're right on the line of the Antonine Wall uh, on the high ground on the south side of the Kelvin Valley. This is the Kelvin Valley, the low ground here in this industrial estate. Lennox Forest, and you can actually see the forest rising up there. The Glazart Water Valley going in there to Lennoxton and the Campses rising up, up there. And uh, yeah, as I'm sure you all know, that the, the Campses are basalt lavas of uh, Carboniferous Age, Lower Carboniferous Age, bounded by a major fault, the Campsie Fault, to, to, to the south. And this is just to uh, illustrate the Campsie Fault and the, 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 the edge of the thing there. And similarly, the Campsies uh, in, in there. So I'm just kind of repeating the obvious. Well, in those dark days of that beautiful spring of uh, 2020, uh, we weren't allowed out much. We couldn't go too far. And uh, what I did was roam about all the pathways and byways round about Kirkintilla to see what I could find in the way of actual rock outcrops. And uh, fortunately, we have a lot of old uh, uh, railway paths. The uh, Strathkelvin railway path follows the old Campsie branch up through Kirk and Tillich, around to Lennoxton, and all the way to Strathblane uh, there. So this is be from between Milton of Campsie and Lennoxton, and we're looking right at the Campsies. Uh, this photograph was actually taken pre-COVID, uh, but it's very nice because it illustrates the snow picks out the tops of the lavas, the weather tops of the lavas. And so you get this layer cake effect of these almost horizontal lavas lying there. They get it, it erupted, the, the top weathers, so you get a, a break in the slope, and this trap topography of this layer cake thing, which uh, just is highlighted there. So that's um, kind of the Milton of Camp say, bit there. But if we go along a bit further west into Lennoxton itself, you can see it perhaps more clearly here, because we're a little bit closer. Uh, there, there's one of the tops of the lavas there, there's another one there. Break of slope, weathered top of the lava that's been weathered, and then the steep vertical bit of the strong lava in, underneath. And uh, as well, you know, so we can trace these all the way along the hillside, and uh, the, the geologists who've mapped this have been able to trace individual lava flows and groups of lava flows for, uh, uh, for some distance, several kilometers, and these are all the various colors and shades shown on the geological map. But the interesting thing here is down below that, We've got this great scree slope, which uh, ha is just beginning to revegetate uh, around here, but is mostly still bare rock. Now, in actual fact, that the, they've got this apron of scree all the way along uh, that the foot of the camps is below the, the, the outcrops. And the, the, it's just exposed here, which indicates, and you, you can actually see there's a runnel of rock up there. This is a very recent rock burst and rock fall. So you have to approach these uh, cliffs with a bit of caution. Uh, I mean, it would be very difficult to get up there anyhow. It's mighty steep, and uh, as I say, you'd probably find that there was a lot of unstable rock if you got a bit close to it. So you want to uh, uh, handle with care uh, in, in there. This is still an active uh, landscape. So we'll, we'll keep a safe distance from it, and we'll move a bit further along. This is, we're on to the west end now. We're up above Strathblane, looking across uh, Strathblane and Blainfield in here. And we'll ignore the bumps at the west end for the moment, but of course we will come back to them. This is just to show that the, the lavas can carry on right along to the end. So for miles and miles and miles, 
you've got these more or less horizontal lava flows and you pick out the individual flows uh, in the pile like that. And if you want a closer look at these, well, it, uh, it, there's a good path that goes up uh, from Clacken of Campsie up the Finn Glen uh, off the left. The, the main tourist trail, which uh, this describes, uh, goes up Campsie Glen itself. Uh, but uh, there's a good path will take you up fa fairly steeply, but it's a, uh, up the hillside <laughs> and into the Finn Glen. And about halfway up there, there's this little waterfall off to the left. And you can actually see the basalt fairly clearly exposed there. You can go right up and, uh, and touch it if, if, if you uh, and examine it if you wish. And I may say, you're about a thousand feet up here, but if you do make it, you turn around, you get the most fantastic view to the south. You can see down over the, the, the Lennox and the Glasgow Water Valley, Lennox Forest, and the whole of Glasgow laid out and strata uh, landscapes to east and west. It, it uh, is well worth the effort of going up there just for the view there, as well as just to examine. Uh, the lava and this little waterfall. But fortunately, uh, we don't need to uh, take such a great uh, drastic steps and exercise to, uh, to, to actually have a look at the lavas. Much easier is just to go to Mugdut Country Park, and, uh, which is, is just outside Glasgow, north of Mulgai, uh, <coughs> turn out left off the, uh, the road to Strathglean. And, uh, you can park there, the visitor centre, very nice and attractive. Go round by Mugdut Castle with all its historical associations, with Marcus of Montrose and others. Down below that to Mugdut Loch. And uh, especially if you do it on a, uh, much, much easier than going all the way up the campsies, especially if you do it on a lovely day like this uh, in late springtime. And on the shore of the, uh, the Mugdut Loch, you can look across and see there's some rock exposed on, there, on the north shore of it. So if we go round to that, this is the lava. It, all of Mugdut Country Park, Park pretty much is, is basalt lavas. And uh, the, the, they are very well exposed on, on this north shore of Mugdut Loch here. And you can see that close up, it's jointed vertically and horizontally, but it's also a rough and irregular thing. The ice has gone along here and picked off all the weather drops. Uh, again, you can see the rounded bits in there. That's deep weathering that would happen in the pre-glacial periods. Uh, with tropical conditions or subtropical conditions and all the loose soil around the core stones has all been stripped away and you've got this <coughs> sort of rough and irregular uh, appearance of the labs there and you can have a good look at them up uh, close if you if you wish it's much easier than climbing up above the Lennoxton and risking a, a scree falling on you interestingly down here we have got whin bushes we've got broom and we've got gorse uh, and uh, some of you may know uh, the colloquial term for basalt and dolerite uh, in the engineering industry, the quarrying industry, is whin, because the whin grows on it. <laughs> it likes well-drained soils, and the, the, the only nutrients it gets from the uh, from the, 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 the basaltic rocks uh, help to uh, uh, all these things to grow. So there's a connection with the, the natural world uh, there. The engineering name is derived from the plants that that, that grow on it. So this is a lovely south-facing sunny slope, but if we go a little bit, well, just a, a mile or so further north and come to a north-facing slope, it looks rather different. And it just shows you the effect that aspect and the water conditions have on the appearance of the slope. This is a, a track above Struth Blaine. As I say, it, it's facing due north, and you can see it's all damp and wet, that there's wet vegetation uh, up there, blaeberries and what have you, uh, birch trees and things moss everywhere, ferns growing out of the thing. It's the same rock, markle bat type basalt, and you can see the, the, the vertical and horizontal jointing in the thing. But in this case, uh, the, the, it looks very different because it's the aspect and the dampness that dominates the appearance of the thing up there. And uh, if we, there are actually places uh, on this track above Struth Plain where the, the uh, glaciers have scraped off all the uh, weathered material and we can actually we're actually walking on the surface of the lava itself and when we get to that we can see that, that the phenocrysts which i'm sure i don't have to explain to uh, an audience of the geological society the large crystals set in the fine grain matrix we've got the feldspar ones there these white ones on, on, on there and we've got a lot of ones that are kind of like a, a smallpox where we've got both ferromagnesium minerals, the, the black ones, uh, olivines and clinopyroxenes, <coughs> and the white ones on, on uh, there. I think this classifies it as Markle-type basalt, 
uh, in, the, in this classification. That there's a detailed classification of lavas based on the size of these phenocrysts and whether they're plagioclase or dominantly olivine or dominantly clinophoxin or whatever. There's uh, six sort of categories. But on the map, it, this is all indicated as, as, as Markle uh, type basalt. Uh, if you want uh, nice specimens of, of rock, the outcrops are not the best place to look. Look in a stream and you'll get lovely wet polished pot pebbles that show all the phenocrystal texture much better than the actual in situ uh, outcrops. Um, but this is, as I say, what it actually looks like when it's exposed uh, on the ground. So that's our, our, our lavas, the, the, the basalts that we've got, what they look like and, uh, there. So having done the, what's been poured out upon the land, we've got to look at how it got there. And uh, we're back to this site and, of course, the <coughs> volcanoes, the vents of Dungoyne and Dumoin at the very west end of the campses. They are actually intruded through lower carboniferous sediments. And uh, it's thought that most of the pile of lavas of the campses were, uh, came from, uh, from, vent system, from linear vent systems, fissures effectively, uh, there. But the, the higher lavas in the pile came mostly from these volcanic uh, vents uh, here at the end. Now again, you, you, you can't really see very much of the rock for, from here. If you, even if you go up close to it, it uh, is largely vegetated and not very clear. But fortunately, elsewhere in Scotland, there are places where we can go where you can get a lovely cross-section right through a volcano. Would you like to see one? That's good. I hope you were going to say that. <laughs> Yeah, on the, the, the Fife coast, the East Fife coast, there's lots of volcanic uh, uh, vents uh, exposed, and uh, this is one such here. And we can see the sort of uh, matrix of the dark grey ash with these bombs or, or clasts of lava uh, in them. And in some places, you get clasts of the country rock as well that's fallen into the thing. Anyone know where this is? Really? Yes, <laughs> yes, well, well done. And just to prove it, that's the harbour building there, there, there really. Um, it's not particularly clear, but you can see on this that the bedding is very steep heading down into the thing. If you actually went round to the lighthouse on there, that the bedding is much more clearly, you can see it all concentric into the centre uh, of, of, of the vent. So that, that, that uh, we, we, we don't have to imagine what a volcano looks like inside a vent. We can actually go and look at it uh, without too much difficulty. So we got to the, the, the vents, but if you go back down that vent a couple of kilometres, you get solid lava, a sort of a pipe or a volcanic neck as it's called. And there's quite a few of these uh, in, in the Strathkelvin area. This is, I mean, this illustrates a number of things. Um, it's a very good crag and tail feature for a start, but uh, again, in the interest of uh, speed, I'll, I'll pass that by. This uh, is about a mile east of Strathblane. Uh, the campsies are just off up the right here. And again, this is, this is on the railway track. I'm, I'm taking this from the old railway track that ran, runs from Lennoxton right up to Strathblain. And there's now a lovely walking, cycling, and, uh, and horse riding track. So this is our run there. If we get a bit closer, uh, on a day that isn't quite as nice and bright, we can see here that instead of volcanic ash, we've got basalt, our dolerite, that has solidified and contracted and given us this columnar jointing in the things rather than the sort of rubbly appearance that we got on the uh, 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 on the lava flows at, uh, at Mugduk Loch. This of course it, it crystallizes from the outside from the edge of the vent in and uh, into, into the center of it so the direction of it can be different at different uh, different parts of the thing but it's a lovely example again we're still on the railway track here you can go right up and have a look at it but again there's big overhangs here so you would want to be just a wee bit careful when you're you know, doing that maybe i'm just a bit of a moose these days anyhow the uh, we've got the eruptive things with the lavas we've got the, the, the necks now we come to the intrusive uh, dolerites and uh, dikes and sills now the, the the lavas and the vents are all sort of uh, lower carboniferous um, roughly 340, 330 million years ago. These intrusions are later. They're thought to be, I think, about 280, 290 million years, sort of up into the Permian or there by our late uh, Carboniferous. So they're intruding all these existing uh, lithified sediments of, car sorry, of uh, Carboniferous sedimentary rocks. And this uh, is a lovely dolerite dike. 
that forms a lovely upstanding feature through the countryside. Uh, this little water course is the Bothlin Burn here. Uh, again, they were back in April 2020. Gorgeous weather, and the trees aren't in leaf yet, so we can actually see lots of things on there. And this is flowing gently around this way, and it ambles up. Uh, Lindsay's a bit down that way, and the Glasgow Edinburgh Railway Line, again, is probably about a mile to the north of us uh, uh, here. And again, this audience, I do not need to inform what a dike is, narrow vertical band of uh, igneous rock intruding into the sedimentary rocks, dark grey, fine grained, uh, fine crystalline rock, and this is it here. As you can see, this one uh, is pretty extensive. Uh, in fact, it's, it's so extensive, it's actually been named the, the Lindsay Torfican Dyke. And uh, if you know where Torfican is, it, uh, <laughs> some, some, some of you do. It's in north of Bathgate, it's in the hills over there, so it's about 30 miles away. And you can also actually get good views of this on the M80, just where the M73 comes in, because it runs right across that, I think they run about here somewhere. Uh, it, it, it used to, in the old days, before they built the M73 and widened the A80, be much more obvious as a great big feature uh, of almost vertical rock face on the east side as you went through uh, on there. But it's, with all the road works and widening, the, the size of the, uh, uh, the exposure has been uh, greatly reduced. But uh, yeah, it can easily be traced uh, through the landscape for, for, for miles and miles there. Uh, they all trending east-west, and as you can see, there's quite a lot of them uh, there. So let's have a bit of a closer look at uh, this one. If you actually come up to that long linear thing, what we find is, is that you're, we're looking at the chilled margin, very fine green, very closely fractured there. So to actually look inside it and get a look at the rock, we actually have to go to another outcrop. This is up uh, near Milton of Campsie. Uh, again, I'm just zooming up and down the old Strathkelvin railway path. Uh, it, 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 it's a tremendous uh, way to get around and see things uh, on there. Uh, this is just west of the station, the old station at Milton of Campsie, and you can see quite clearly in here that the, the, the yeah, horizontal and vertical joints as the, the, the dolerite has cooled in there, and if you get up to it, it, it you can feel it's slightly uh, rough textured with the interlocking crystals of the uh, feldspars and uh, ferromagnesium minerals. You can also see it in the bed of the Glazert water, or at least you could in April 2020 when the river was very, very low, uh, and uh, it makes a nice picture. You're looking downstream there, just that this Bridgeton Road goes over the, uh, the, the, the Glazert water. If we went there now, that would be completely uh, invisible as well below water level. It's only really when the river is very low that you can actually see the, these exposures there. So things like the railway cuttings and so forth are, are very, very handy because you can actually examine and see the rocks there, whereas without uh, worrying about getting swept away by a foaming uh, torrent. And of course, what these dikes did, they fed lava flows at the surface. And uh, perhaps a, a few years ago, we wouldn't have uh, had maybe had a picture of what a fissure eruption uh, looks like. But uh, thanks to the recent developments in Iceland in the southeast corner, we can get a perfect picture. Here's a fissure eruption and there, and here's the lava streaming away out of it. And this is how a lot of the lavas of the Campsies are thought to have formed, the sort of vent systems along the south end of the side of the Campsies and along the north side. And here's a contemporary one. So uh, the, the lava, the Campsies might look nice and peaceful and tranquil now, but uh, uh, at the time that this was all being erupted, it would have been rather, rather more lively. We've got the dikes, uh, and now we've got to look at the sills, which are very important in the uh, various aspects as what we'll come across. That's where the rock gets intruded along a band of weak rock, often uh, coal or something like that, or weak mudstones, and, and forms a very strong layer, anything up to 50 metres or more thick, in the country rock. And there's a lot of these round Kilsyth, like Bar Hill and Croy Hill, and that sort of area. And there's a lot of quarries around there. This is Ockenstarry Quarry, which is just down beside the Forth and Clyde Canal there. These rocks are very, very popular with quarrymen and with engineers. They make excellent aggregate, hard, strong, durable, and very importantly, uniform. In other words, the properties are reliable. You can get a consistent product out of it. So uh, there's lots and lots of old quarries around Kilsyth, around Croy. You can see them from the, uh, uh, the railway going uh, between Lindsay and Croy. Uh, and and uh, that. There's still two active quarries, uh, one in Croy itself, just across from the station, 
and one up, up above Colsium Lennox, a country park at the east uh, side of Kilsyth. And there, but all the others are all closed now. And uh, we can actually see the, the rocks there, all nice, clean, fissured uh, uh, rocks on there. And they just do, they're particularly popular for roadstone, the dolerite, uh, because one, it bonds very well with the bitumen, so it, it sticks together very well. And also, it's, it, it gives you a good friction surface uh, because you've got the contrast between the, the plagioclase and the uh, uh, the kind of pyroxenes and so forth, so you get a texture on the thing which is maintained as it as it uh, wears away and under the traffic. So they're very very useful for roadstone, uh, in particular. They're good for other purposes as well, but particularly good for the, uh, for these two uh, uh, reasons. And just to prove that they are particularly rough and handy, it's also very popular with rock climbers as a training ground. And uh, you can see the ropes and the guy up on the top uh, there. Fortunately, just happened to be there when I went along to take the pictures. And that's all this black stuff round here, round Kilsyth and up on Bar Hill and Croy Hill, round here, which we shall, uh, we shall come to. Again, however, that's what it looks like in the quarry. Uh, natural outcrops of dolerite look very different. Uh, up here, we have a, a dolerite outcrop on the back of Croy Hill coming down towards Craig Marlock, for, for those that know that area. You can see us sort of looking north to the west end of the camps is there. Uh, this gentleman, some of you may know, it's my very good friend and former boss, Paul Carter, and up there who lives in the area of Patai Banton. And uh, he kindly took me up there last autumn. Uh, and call, these, he calls these the cloven stones, um, possibly in the, uh, the idea that, that uh, anything that can't be explained can be put down to the devil and his <laughs> cloven hoofs or whatever. But you see that they're all rounded and, and lumped all together uh, uh, like this. And round Kilsyth, there's lots, you see lots of big, big boulders or outcrops of, uh, of dolerite like this, things poking out the ground here and there. Again, this has been stuff that's been deeply weathered prior to glaciation, and all the weather stuff's been swept away and turned into the boulder clay and, uh, and other things. And these might be all in situ or they might have been scraped by a glacier from somewhere further up the slope and just sort of dumped in the one bit here. You know, the geologists can argue for hours and days, if not longer, on, on topics like this. Or you can just describe it to the Dibble and uh, <laughs> make everything much simpler. But you see, if you come across dolerite in, in the raw, it's more likely to look like this than what you see in the clean face in a, in a quarry. That's simply because it's been blasted and opened uh, up on there below the surface. So we've had enough, I think, of uh, igneous rocks to be going on with a bit. It's time that we started looking at the sedimentary rocks and what we can see of them. And uh, going to start uh, with the sandstones. Uh, in fact, these particular sandstones and associated conglomerates are the strata that succeed above the, the Clyde Plateau Volcanic Formation, the Strathclyde Group. Uh, and this is around close to Mungduck Country Park, but a little bit further east. So you're up stratigraphically a little bit higher up. If you go, remember the road from Mulgai to Strathblane that I've mentioned before, if instead of turning left to go off the Mungda Country Park, you carry on and you start to go down towards Strathblane. There's a couple of laybys, one on each side, and there's a trail, nature trail, that takes you down to Loch Ardinning. And these big crags of sandstone conglomerate are the first thing that you see through the screen of the trees. If you follow it round the loch, it's a lovely, lovely walk. I heartily recommend it. You come out onto the moor beyond with wonderful views up to the campsites. So uh, there's great benefits to be had for these things besides the, the geological interest. Uh, this is the sort of sandstone and conglomerate bands in the, in, the, in the rock. You can see the conglomerate bits up there. There's even actually a bit with a sign that says conglomerate on top of it to, to explain where you are, which is, is, is very helpful. I should have got a picture of that, but unfortunately my thumb was a bit over the camera. Here's our, our conglomerate. You can see it's dominantly quartz, dominantly fairly reasonably rounded, and uh, the sandstone as well is fairly coarse grained and fairly roughly bedded. Uh, this is thought to be very much uh, sheet wash uh, alluvial fan deposits coming out from the Highland Front up near the Highland Boundary Fault, weathering down the old the islands that came up during the Caledonian orogeny and uh, spread out across the land. As you go higher up, it becomes more sandstone and less conglomerate. Uh, and uh, the, the area between 
uh, Locker Dinning and uh, Lennox Castle is predominantly sandstone. Uh, the, 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 the old wives' lifts, the, the, the two, the big sandstone pillars or whatever above uh, Craig Maddy uh, are, 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 are of this uh, sandstone. Uh, and over on Lennox, uh, Lennox Castle side, the Lover's Leap, which is a crag of sandstone, is again tarred sandstone. It's all now the Strathclyde group. Um, it used to be called the Calciferous Sandstone series, which uh, I think it gives you a better picture for, certainly in this area, what, what this stratum is mostly about. There are other bits of, uh, of mudstone and things in it, and near the top we get uh, limestones and other uh, rock types coming in. But uh, the stuff that dominates the topography, the high moorland thing, is dominantly the sandstone and the conglomerate. And that's just, that's the stippled stuff here, the Strathclyde group, to, to indicate here. And the uh, Craig Maddy Moor and things that go over here, heading towards Lennoxton over there. <coughs> As we go up into the Carboniferous, the sandstones tend to become rather more finer grained. And we're, we're getting away from the, the mountain foot and the, 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 the alluvial fans. We're going down river. There are still some grits indicating sort of channel uh, deposits. But we're getting down to the deltaic areas, they're getting much more medium to fine grain sandstone, well bedded, and uh, hence much easier to quarry and to use for building stone. And of course Glasgow is built of sandstone more than absolutely anything else. And uh, most of these quarries unfortunately are now inaccessible, uh, the, the many have been backfilled, redeveloped or just closed off. But uh, I found this little one on my doorstep in Kirkintilloch. I didn't even know it was there until you know I started perhaps paying more attention to the immediate neighbourhood than uh, I had before COVID. Um, and again, if I'd waited a month, I wouldn't have seen it at all because once these trees all come into leaf, you can't see the rock at all. But this is a sandstone quarry. You can see it dipping to the uh, to the left and into the, the quarry face here. Uh, for those that know Kirkintilloch, this is down below the Old Isle Cemetery and just above the Bothlin Burn. You may remember we mentioned the Bothlin Burn earlier. That was a, a way up at the Dollarite Dyke. Well, we've now come <coughs> further, further south, we're downstream, we're past underneath the Glasgow to Edinburgh Railway, and we're heading down towards it where it joins the, the Luggy and then flows down into the, 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 the Kelvin. So just acquainting us uh, where, where we go in there. And this quarry uh, was opened in the late uh, 1870s, uh, or, there, or thereby. And we're lucky because we know where a lot of the sandstone went. Um, Lenzi is very much built of uh, lovely sandstone villas. And, and, and Lenzi is just a, a few hundred yards off to the, the left, more or less there. But even closer to that, on the other side of the Bodlin Burn, on the ridge up between there and the Glasgow Edinburgh Railway, was Woodley Asylum, or Woodley Hospital as it latterly was. And you, you'd probably, if you know the thing, you'd have seen this building as tall long sandstone building standing on the skyline as you went on the train from Lindsay towards Croy. Uh, long since uh, closed and, and demolished. But they have, in the, the, the now redeveloped of modern housing as Woodley Village, but they have thankfully retained a couple of the old sandstone buildings so we can see very clearly what the actual sandstone looks like. Uh, and they're medium to fine grain and uh, uh, very typical of the sort of building stone that was used in there. Now, there were lots of local quarries like this that supplied local leads, uh, needs, but uh, as, uh, as mentioned in, in, in the uh, estimable publication that uh, one of your members produced on the building stones of Glasgow, there's two main quarries, the two main strata that supplied building sandstone for, for Glasgow, Bishop Briggs sandstone and the Gifnick sandstone, both in the upper limestone group rather different uh, in texture. The Bishop Briggs sandstone is very like this uh, Wood Lee one, uh, medium to fine grain mostly. And uh, again, the, the, the workings are all largely inaccessible now. I grew up in Gifnock, and I can remember in, in my earliest years, would be the late 50s or very early 60s, they were still infilling the uh, old sandstone quarries in Gifnock. We knew there were big caverns underneath the hill with a farm on it, not far, I, I lived close to Huntley Park, uh, right around there. And uh, we used to play in the park and down in the stream at the bottom. And the little branch line came off from the railway at Giffnick Station, round the top of the quarry, 
and they would tip all this ash and slag down and you can see it splashing down into the great big pool of water you know no health and safety stuff in, in those days fortunately we all survived without incident later on i can remember uh, they had actually finished filling it in and again we could quite easily go around onto this uh, myself and other kids in the, in the Gifnick area just go down the bottom of Huntley Park, round along the burn and back up and wander, we used to wander over there and play about on, on, on this ash surface and that. Uh, it's it's uh, still undeveloped and it's now fenced off very closely and guardly because what's in there is largely slag from the Parkhead Forge, Beardmore's Parkhead Forge, which I think was steel slag and it's very chemically reactive uh, and the, the cost of dealing with this, and I mean it is uh, huge so nobody's actually dared to develop it it's all just sort of sealed off with uh, much much thicker fencing now than it uh, than it used to be so uh, th things kind of go around uh, on, on, on there it was a great solution at the time yeah let's just dump all this stuff in this big hole um, but now it's sterilized the whole uh, uh, the whole, whole area uh, however that's just kind of a, a bit of a digression but uh, Build sandstone, uh, built Glasgow, and this is what some of it looks like. And this is where it is. It's roughly in between Kirk and Tillich and Lindsay there. So, sandstone, of course, is one of the major rock types that occupies a large part of the succession. We're now coming to the stuff that occupies much smaller proportions of the whole succession, but economically are very, very important. Limestone. Uh, in this case, at the, the Linden of uh, Baldernock. Now, the limestone was extensively quarried round about, but the, the old quarries have all been filled in or have collapsed and aren't accessible at all. The only one that seems to be in, at least in the a area around Kirkintillich, is, is this one. And it's a very famous exposure, actually. Have any of you been there? Yep, one. It, it takes a bit, it's a. It's a I've tried to focus mainly on, on exposures and things that are easy to get to and close to, to, to major pathways or roads or things like that. This requires a bit of a trek uh, and it has a bit of an appearance of something out of Game of Thrones or The Lord of the Rings, but uh, it's done the worst for that. Uh, and it's uh, a very famous exposure in the Glasgow area. So I'll, let's have a look at it in a little bit more detail. What have we got here? Close, well, well obviously we've got pillar and stall workings in the actual limestone itself, and that will lead us on to the next section. But just looking at the geology at the moment, the roof of the uh, mine is formed by a dolerite sill there, at the top of which is the Hurlet Coal, I think, which is in about there, and uh, then the Hurlet Limestone should be further up on, on there. Then we've got the actual Baldernock, or Baldernock limestone itself, which uh, is not really a very typical Carboniferous limestone. It's a freshwater limestone rather than a marine one. And uh, it's at the top uh, of the Strathclyde group, just below the, the Hurlet Coal and Limestone, which are at the very top of that uh, uh, basal group of, of the thing on there. But it's the one we've got. We can see this one, so uh, we could get that. Underneath are sort of a rubbly sandstone and limestone mixture. And down at the bottom, we've got a black mudstone, the Balgrochen beds with marine shells in it. Uh, and this is one of the few exposures of mudstone that will be in this presentation because it's a rather shy and retiring material and uh, it's difficult to get good exposures of it or ones that can look out good on, on photographs. So we've got an interesting sort of sequence here of marine fossils then going up through non-marine and then we then go up into a coal at the top if it wasn't for the, uh, the dolerite. The, the limestone is a white limestone here but uh, also appears black around here. It's been baked by the, the sill of course uh, and it was a fairly low quality. It's a dolomitic limestone. Uh, and uh, it was used locally uh, just for agricultural lime and obviously it was worth their while uh, mining it with uh, the, this good stable roof uh, in, in, in there but it, it wasn't hugely economically uh, uh, valuable. It's also got quite a lot of pyrite in it which limits its uh, use for anything else uh, on, on, on there. So that's a quick uh, guide to uh, limestone and that's uh, probably elusive uh, rock although very important in the economic and social development of the area. And that's just in this little, that's the pink, uh, orangey bit is the sill uh, itself and the, you just see the stipple bit of the Strathclyde group in there. Of course, my, talking of mining and economic extraction of, of minerals brings us inevitably naturally to coal. 
uh, and the colliery spoil tips back where we started, really. Uh, this is the same waterside bing uh, which I took a picture from that, that, that started the presentation, but this is it from the south side, and obviously at a totally different time of year, again during those first uh, months, months of lockdown. And this is the Edinburgh Glasgow railway line just immediately to the south of it, uh, down there. This flat area around here you also used to be a large colliery spoil tip. Uh, it's been landscaped and removed some time ago, and most of the bings have suffered. That's the fate that they've suffered. There's not very many of them actually still left. For, for they've either been recycled and reused in construction or various things, washed to get coal and things out of them, or just landscaped and re redeveloped. Uh, so our waterside bing is a fairly unique. Uh, thing and its shape shows beautifully the method of construction. It's a ramp, basically there's a shaft down at the, in the, the colliery itself, the Western Guard Shore colliery. All the spoil that come out from driving the shaft and from the tunnels out to the various coals, which are in the, in the limestone coal group down below the, the surface, gets just run up in, in trolleys and end tipped here to give us this ramp up there. And it's nearly all mudstone, hence you get the black colour, which, uh, when there's not snow on it anyway, which uh, also makes it actually very slippy uh, if, you, if you want to go up there and let it set in a long dry spell, or when it's frozen and got snow on it, uh, it's, uh, and you can actually get up it without sort of getting covered in, in, in muck. It operated from 1872 to 1950, and like many of the smaller colonies, it didn't survive nationalisation. Uh, and they are enclosed soon after everything moved over to Cardow into the bigger pits at, uh, at that stage. This just uh, uh, shows the end uh, from the end on, and it's not perhaps uh, quite as steep as it looks, although a lot of that is down to the effect of the, uh, the vegetation on there. And that is round about there, and you can see the limestone coal root there poking out from underneath the upper limestone root. All the coals and things that we're and looking for were down in that, so we dug down into them with those strata. There's a lot of mining around Twecker and the <coughs> kill sides around Banton and the places around the other side to the east of, uh, of, of Kilsyth. There are a lot of seams very close together, both coal and ironstone. And this is just another uh, colliery spoil tip. This is actually at Twecker um, on, the, on the Fourth and Clyde Canal. Uh, the shaft is way up here. This is the path up Bar Hill, actually. It goes up round there and it does a sort of dog leg at this point. And the spoil tip runs all the way down here, down to the edge of the canal. Because, of course, one of the reasons for citing the uh, collier collieries here was because they could get the product out and a lot of the coal and the ironstone from all the pits along the canal up to Cadder and round there at Bishop Briggs went down to the Cadder Ironworks down at the eastern end, down, down at, uh, uh, towards Falkirk. Where you get uh, colliery spoil tips, you've obviously got shafts, you've got old mine workings, and uh, here uh, we, we've got uh, an example of an old mine shaft. Uh, and very often these have settled a bit and water strains in them, and the fact that you fence them off, you get trees growing in them, so you can spot them quite a way away. This is in the uh, what's termed the South Bray of Campsey. It, it's the slope on the south side of Campsey going up to Lennox Forest. Uh, limestone coal group on the very top of the Strathclyde group, a number of uh, coal seams and a few iron seams as alum shale as well, all of which were exploited and along with the Hurlet limestone, uh, all used in, in industry in Lennoxton and contributed a lot to the development of that uh, locality. But these were very early workings, long before there was a requirement to keep records for them, which I think wasn't until about 1860s or 1870s uh, uh, thereby. These were all long before that. And they were shallow workings, and, and they occurred in places like this, where you could see uh, outcrops of the coal and this other strata in the streams coming down off Lennox Forest, off the moor, uh, up, up there. And they started working the things in from there, and then sinking shafts to catch them up and go down around there. So the South Bray of Campsey is absolutely pitted, and Lennox Forest as well, with old mine shafts. And uh, when I first moved there in the uh, 1980s, uh, none of them were really fenced off at, at all, or only very uh, loosely with falling apart fences. In recent years, they've all been um, uh, fenced off much more securely, and, and notices, the Coal Authority notices based on there. But the, the, the ground all around there, it's kind of 
uneven and sunken. It's all collapsed, shallow mine workings there, and broken ground. You get the, you get your eye in for this after a while, that, that it just doesn't look natural at all. And there's often spoil, spoiled tips and things there, and bits of coal, fine, and mudstone show, showing out round about. These are really old workings. So uh, in, in urban and built up areas, they'll generally have the shafts will have been capped and infilled, but uh, in, in places like this, there's no money to do anything like that. There's no records of them, so, but they have at least nowadays uh, fenced them off and put up warning notices. So beware where you, you wander. We're up uh, here, up behind Lennoxton, at the top of the Strathclyde <coughs> group, lower limestone group uh, area. The other thing that you get from that is ferruginous seepages. The uh, drainings, uh, there's a lot of pyrite in the, in the coals themselves and in the mudstones round about them. Uh, Rainwater seeps in and gets into them. They, they, they built lots of drainage levels to drain the mine so they could actually work the minerals in the dry. And the water nowadays and it seeps down through the old workings, picks up iron and sulphate. Uh, it's a very little oxygen down there, so it stays in solution as iron 2 plus. But the minute it hits the, the atmosphere at the entrance to the, the drainage levels, it oxidizes and you get this gunk of ochre. Ferric hydroxide, XH2O, where X is a large number, this amorphous mass. There will be other metals attached in there, manganese, aluminium, maybe nickel, copper, goodness knows what, that, that have come out of the shales. Uh, that. So it just kills everything off. Uh, again, there are places in East Ayrshire and so forth where they put in treatment plants for that, but it's a very big and expensive thing. You need huge reed beds and whatever, and there's only going to, you're only going to do that where there's a, an economic need to do it. Otherwise, they just get left to <coughs> pollute the ditches and to seep into the rivers. And certainly around Kirkintil, in a lot of areas, you see these, I see them in the luggy near me, little seepages of ferruginous water coming in. This is the Glazert water, early May 2020. It's just, you're literally Lennox, and they're just off the left uh, in there. You can see the orange color and some seepages and things around there. Lots of old mine workings in there. So uh, our economic prosperity, has come at a, an environmental price that two centuries on and more we're still paying. So with, with which sobering thought, I'll turn on, and I think I'd probably better speed up a bit. Uh, yeah, this, this, no, it's all right. Oh, that's good, we've got all night. <laughs> it, it looks as if some of you didn't uh, think it started until 7.30. <laughs> so I think that's a cue too. Anyhow, yes, so... What, what if we can't uh, see so much rock, what we can see? Well, we can see that there's boulder clay here. And uh, if we look at it on a, on a winter's day when it's not snowing, we get this mounded uh, landscape, ground up rock and soil, often dark gray, brown to, to, to black in, 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 the, in, in this area, forming mounds elongated in a west-east direction due to the glacier mounding it along that. Because it's all so compressed, uh, it's very impermeable. There's not actually that much clay in most of it, but it, you get a continuous grading from the fines, the silt and the clay, right up to the boulders, and so it becomes very impermeable. It sheds water uh, off it, and so you get these boggy hollows uh, in between the things. And in the places you get locks and sort of fens, and there's a, a little loch called the Gad Loch down to the, uh, the south southwest of Lindsay. It, uh, if any of you have been around that area, you can see that is one of these. It occupies these hollows between... Uh, the, the, the boulder clay ridges. That's our colliery spoil tip, so, and the, the, the railway line is just uh, below that. So just keeping everything orientated so you, you know where you are. And uh, the, the, what's now the M80 runs very much through boulder clay from Rob Royston eastwards uh, until it gets up towards about the M73 and there's a big a PT area on, on, on the left hand side. But most of this is classic boulder clay. It's, terrain. Uh, there's a footbridge over it. Uh, uh, to, to, this is the old railway line uh, that the, the Monklands and Kirk and Tillich railway. Uh, it's again in a footpath. Uh, and this picture of a, a remarkably quiet uh, M80 of course was taken in April uh, 2020 when it's um, usually quiet. But it's typical uh, boulder clay landscape. One of my first uh, jobs in the uh, site investigation where we did the steps bypass, as it was called, which is the first phase of the M80. It went up uh, from off the M8 from Problem Gas Works uh, over the railway and uh, 
up to Rob Royston, and it opened, which was old Rob Royston Hospital then, and then it, it turned uh, to, to the east and went, runs along this ridge of boulder clay. Uh, and I did lots of boreholes and trial pits up there, and I can assure you, ladies and gentlemen, it's all boulder clay along <laughs> that line. It's more varied, <laughs> down to, much more varied down towards uh, uh, the M8, but that's another story. So the, there's our typical boulder clay landscape. And, uh, that's rough, roughly, you know, somewhere round about there. Boulder clay is, again, a fairly shy sort of thing because it is, tends to be vegetated and covered up. And so, again, construction excavations are the best way to actually see it. And this is just a picture I took, just purely on chance, uh, parking the car in the Buchanan Galleries, uh, actually on the side above the road there. And you look, oh, hello. Uh, we've got this wonderful ex <laughs> excavation into the boulder clay here. And you can see the boulders and things in there, the stones in there, and the matrix, the sort of grey-brown, fine grain matrix in there, cut into little terraces for stability. And it's a bonus here because we've got some mudstone, carboniferous mudstone, peeking out at the bottom of the thing. Now, that uh, was just before COVID, and, and uh, it's all now covered up and, and uh, revegetated, and uh, stuff built in down here, so you can't see it anymore. Um, Boulder clay exposures tend to be rather fleeting, but if you see one, that, that, then get a picture of it because it, it's worth, worth it have, having for your collection to, to see what it actually looks like. This is a little bit away, but uh, it gives you an idea of what it's like. So these deposits can be very thick, uh, 30, 40 metres in, in, in places in these mounds. And of course, we've got a name for these mounds. Uh, anyone from Mulgai here? Yeah. Yes. Do you know this uh, address at all? It's the street up from me. Oh, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> That's yours. <laughs> no, I wish. <laughs> this is Drumlin Drive, uh, which I had to go and visit and get a, a picture of. And then you can see from the thing there, it's on a, a fairly steep slope, but it is a genuine Drumlin. And then the road kind of goes round to it and winds up onto the top. So that, that's our boulder clay. To conclude our tale, we, we come really back where we started, the Kelvin Valley. The, the, the thing, everything re revolves or comes round into that. This is a major geological feature running across central Scotland. I think if you look at the map and uh, things, you can realise it's a very major topographical feature. Uh, it's the lowest section between uh, east and west or across the, the, the central belt. Uh, but it isn't really, unless you're a geologist, that you know there's a whole lot of things underlying that. It's an over-deepened, buried valley beneath that, which between Kirkintillock and Torrance is about 100 metres deep, infilled with a great succession of sands, gravels, silts, clays, tongues of boulder clay around the sides coming in, alluvium uh, over the top in, in the boggy parts. And this atmospheric, uh, or hopefully atmospheric picture, predates COVID. Uh, in a November day, about a decade ago, taken from Bar Hill from the Roman fort and the Antonine Wall there, and uh, you can imagine the sort of poor Romans from some, some warm, sunny climb thinking, what have I come to? <laughs> Why did they send me here? <laughs> so we're actually looking across the valley and up the Glazert Valley there at the foot of the camp season there. The main valley goes down, down that way. But you see it's all pretty flat and low lying. There used to be a lot more Monday, actually. A lot of the farm names are things like Inch Belly, Inch Turf, uh, and those who are familiar with the Gaelic, the Inch means island. They were mounds of fluvial glacial sand and gravel, but they've largely all been uh, quarried out down to about the water table long ago, so it all looks a lot flatter than it was. Uh, it's also been undermined, which has caused it to settle, and that's partly why you get these wet, uh, boggy areas in there, because the water's coming up, up from below. But that's from Bar Hill looking down across the, the, the deep valley. If we go a little bit further east, up Croy Hill, and uh, here we're looking across a much narrower valley. Uh, we've got the Forth and Clyde Canal coming through here. Again, it goes through the Kelvin Valley because it's a narrow uh, gap and it's the lowest height you want to, uh, to, that you can get across the, the central belt. And beyond that, we've got Kilsyth and the Campses. And I think I forgot to mention that, yes, <laughs> underneath all of the, 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 the buried valley, there's a very major fault uh, the Mulgai Kilsyth Fault, which down throws to the south something like 500, 600 metres. I mean, there's no trace of this at all at the surface. 
Um, but, but below this valley and all this thick, that's, because, that's why the valley's there. It's a sort of weakness that, that the ice has picked up. Uh, it also marks a change in the sedimentation uh, that to the north of that, you've got gently dipping strata, dipping di di more or less sub-horizontally down into the, uh, into the Kelvin Valley. To the south of it, it's much more contorted, tightly folded and faulted uh, to that, and you're much higher up the, the sequence. So this is actually marks quite a geological break uh, in there. But it kind of runs out when you get to Hillside because you hit the dolerite, and that kind of force terminates the, the, the fault and forces the glaciers to come up. And then you've got another basin further east of Dulliter Bog, uh, up, up to the, the head of the valley at, at Bank Knock. So the, the geology has had a big effect on that. And if we look down there, we're looking west down it from Croy Hill, and there's Spar Hill down, down there. And this in here is the Antonine Wall. Uh, the Romans liked a nice bit of dolerite. Uh, Hadrian's Wall was built on dolerite, and uh, they saw the potential of the, the, the dolerite here and built the Antonine Wall on it, overlooking this, what would have been a marshy, swampy bit, and then the inaccessible hills beyond it made a perfectly sensible place to stop and place your frontier. Although they, they didn't thankfully stay for, for very long. Maybe it was the weather. Uh, coming along to, um, to Bar Hill, there's this famous section with the cut, that ditch cut into the, the rock there. But the Romans weren't the first to see the potential. This is Castle Hill just above Bar Hill. It's an Iron Age fort, or the remains of an Iron Age fort on top of that. So this has been a significant uh, site for set settlement and habitation right from earliest times in, in history. It's a high lookout point. You can command who comes and goes and what, to, what goes through there. So this again is dolerite uh, uh, dominating everything in there. And you can see the, the top of the Kelvin Valley up there at Mount Knock and everything coming down, down through here. We come down to the Kirkintillich Kirk area here. We come down off the sides of the valley. This is the valley floor uh, on a beautiful day in June. It looks very nice and very pleasant. Uh, the actual river is just behind us to the left here and the Hasten Golf Course is behind that, rising up in there. That's Kirkintilloch down centre through the trees there. And uh, it looks lovely in June. Um, but if you look, you'll see there's flood buttons all the way along there, protecting all these houses and industrial estates. And this has flooded uh, uh, quite regularly. And with the intense climate change and storms that we get, uh, this remains a risk and might get worse and might need further uh, work to keep the, the, the valley uh, or the structures at the edge of the valley safe. Uh, I, I can remember very much the, the great storm of uh, December 1994 where it poured for about 48 hours absolutely torrentially and uh, over a weekend and suddenly we had Lake Kelvin. The whole valley was flooded and it didn't drain I think until about the end of February, March. And, uh, it, you know, it took months to, to, uh, to, to, to drain away. So that was you know, 20 years, 30 years ago now, uh, it, it can happen again. And this winter being very wet, we've seen wet patches and things around there, but nothing quite on that scale. But with climate change, we can probably expect more of this. And so we might have to take more flood protection measures. But to finish, uh, oh, sorry, yes, <laughs> we're down there, for what it's worth. To finish with a nice, lovely, tranquil picture. The, the canal, uh, of course, has to keep its level. Uh, it, it's all at one uh, level from Wineford Locks up at Bank Knock, right well into beyond Lamp Hill and in, into the uh, outskirts of Glasgow before they start to go down a very long summit pond. Uh, the Kelvin Valley looks very flat, but it does fall gradually towards the west. Uh, and so the canal comes up onto the banks uh, of the ground. And here we're at Hillhead Basin. This is Hillhead Bridge, a swing bridge there. Centre of Kirk and Tillich is about 100 yards or so behind the, the photograph there. And uh, it, it seemed a nice place to sort of uh, end and just to illustrate how geology and uh, uh, human settlement and habitation work together to create the communities that we have today and the history that we've had in the past. So I'll just end by acknowledging my sources, uh, the two memoirs, the relevant 1 to 50,000 maps, and this little publication by Strathkelvin District Libraries back in about 1984-85, uh, 
mines and minerals of Campsie, which very much refers to the Milton and Campsie and Lennoxton area. And it's got a lot of interesting historical data, which again shows how the minerals that they had, the range, limestone, coal, ironstone, alum shale, contributed to all the different industries that developed in that area, the development of the community. And also, here's the textbooks and things, the little books I've consulted for uh, the history of the, the, the area that I've been describing, some in more detail than, the, uh, the, the, than others, some have very little about geology, others are quite a bit, and you get uh, unexpected sections and things in it. The, the, the Horn book, which was actually written in about 1911, published then, contains a, a very detailed history of the mining in the Kirkintilic area, the East End around there. This is available from Kirkintilic libraries, uh, and they're all available, Mulgai, Bears Den, uh, Boldernock, and, and of course the Canal Guidebook also includes information on that. Edited by my good friend Mr. Paul Carter, of course. Uh, on there. Now, wherever you live, you can go along to your local library and you'll find the equivalent of these things there. And they're a good starting place for uh, knowing about interesting geological sites and the history of where you might find interesting geological exposures or things that relate to the history of the area. That's just the actual official titles of the things, and they can all be obtained uh, from the BGS website, bgs.ac.uk. So that, that's my whistle-stop tour around the geology of Strathkelvin, and I'm very happy to answer any questions. <laughs>